We've got 20 verses to get through. Let's read it through, and then let's go, all right? Starting in verse 32 of chapter 10, if you would read it with me, I would appreciate that. i got to look a little closer because, yeah. Verse 32 starts us off. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who were followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. But three days later, he will rise. Verse 35 says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let us sit at your right hand and the other on your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Yeah, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink of the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those who, for whom they have been prepared. Then when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them all together and said, Hey, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then it finishes out with chapter 10 with verse 46. It says, Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, excuse me, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, son of Timaeus, was sitting on the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, excuse me, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Woohoo is right. So we start off in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. All right, we start out, it says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. And again, he took the 12 aside and he told them what was gonna happen. Now, it says that they were going up to Jerusalem. From a spiritual standpoint, you always go up to Jerusalem, but also (laughs) it's 2,500 feet above sea level. So no matter where you're coming from, you're always going up to Jerusalem from a spiritual standpoint and from uh, usually from a physical standpoint as well. And the reason why I think they're afraid by this time, Jesus was a wanted man. And that doesn't mean wanted in a good way. Okay, he was wanted, meaning people want to kill him. He was wanted by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. If you remember, they were sending people from Jerusalem to trap him. And and Jesus kept reversing the curse, and they were getting madder and madder at Jesus because the people started following him. They started loving the Lord with all their heart and not the religious Pharisees. Oh, and they wanted to kill him. Even the Herodians, that would be like, I don't know, the worldly folks of the day, the political folks of the day, and, and, and they hated him too. They all saw him as a threat to power, and Jerusalem was the seat of that power. So he's going to the very place where everybody hates him and wants to kill him. So they're freaking out. 
both the disciples and that entourage that's following him besides the disciples probably knew that something was going to happen when he entered that city and they were confused. Why would their Messiah purposely go to a deadly, dangerous place knowing that people are trying to kill him? Why would we do that when we have to enter the city? Why go there? And, and so they were afraid, it says, right? And, oh, sorry, I went a little bit too far. Second. So Jesus tries to tell the 12 disciples again. You know what? And can I tell you something? That gives me hope. Yeah. Listen, Jesus already told him in Mark chapter 8, 31, if you were here for that teaching, he's already told them this. Hey, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to be persecuted and be turned over. I'm going to be betrayed. It's all going to happen. It's got to... And then he told him again in Mark chapter 9, 31. Hey, guys, I'm going to die. We're gonna be bad, ba -ba and they're just saying, yep, Lord, we get it. And he don't got it. So he's telling them again, guys, okay, th this, is, this is what's going to happen, okay? I, I, I want you to remember. It makes me think of Isaiah 50, verse 7, which which says, it makes me think of Jesus. He's, he's knowing what's going to come about. Not only is he knowing the, the mocking and the rejection and all that, but he knows that he's going to have to take the sins of the world, and yet he's setting his face like a flint. And he's going, doing what he needs to do in the Lord. And it reminds me of Isaiah 50, verse 7, that says, For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I'll not be ashamed. Can I tell you something? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower, if you're a Christian here, and you're a professing Christian, you know what you need to do? The same thing as Jesus. Listen, following Jesus isn't always roses and rainbows. And if you have are those churches that have gone to those churches and say, hey, if you're following Jesus makes everybody healthy, wealthy, and you prance through the posies all the days of your life, let me tell you just flat out that's a lie. Now, God might bless you and do wonderful things in your life. Thank you, Lord. He might even give you riches. Wonderful. You can use it for the kingdom, but it's not going to come without persecution and suffering and trials. That's just the truth. So we, you, me, need to set our faces like a flint. We need to go and look to Jesus, right, for everything. You don't need to look to me. What happens? God forbid, I say this in all honesty, God forbid I... Or your husband or your wife or your kids or your coworkers or whatever, whoever you look to, right? Right? You, I, we, we need to look to Jesus, set our face like a flint right on him, right? He's going to get us through. No one else. Does that make sense? And if somebody usually raises their hand, what's a, what's a flint? Okay. So flint's like a hard, usually a black rock, right? And, and like a flintlock pistol, you know what it would, something hard. Anyway, they used to make tools out of it back in Jesus' day or arrowheads or spearheads because it was a hard, hard rock, right? And so, uh, and it, yes. And so flint is figuratively used in the Bible to express the toughness of an impossible task. You can read about that yourself. You want to make a note in Deuteronomy 8.15 or on Psalm 114.80. And it also talks about uh, uh, setting your face like a flint like speaking of unwavering determination. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Ezekiel 3. Love that. We're to set our face like a flint and we're going to follow him no matter what. Darren, yes. Isn't it also used to sharpen knives? It can do that as well. Yes. Like yes. Swords. Yes. So that's how we're supposed to be, right? Almost immovable, right? That's how God wants us to be. Mark 10, 33 and 34 continues, and he's explaining to them what's going to happen next. He says, hey, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. And he said, he's telling them, and, and he said, we. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, us too. Ooh, we're, but if you go, that means we might be targets too. And that's why they were afraid, I think. And he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They didn't want to hear that. They will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over 
to the Gentiles. What? Wait, they're going to hand them over to the, to the Romans? No, we hate them too. That's even worse. And they're going to mock him. The Messiah? Spit on him. Flog him. Most people didn't even survive the flogging. And they're going to eventually kill him. And then he said, three days later, they're going to rise again. Now, listen. <laughs> Again, Jesus is trying to explain to these disciples what's going on. He must go up to Jerusalem. He must go up to Jerusalem. And the whole reason is so that he could be lifted up, right, on that cross, right? The Lamb of God offered for the sins of the world. But this just didn't compute in their minds. They just... I, oh, I had a great illustration. So the Lord just gave me a little check. said, don't say it. No! Oh, so sorry. Now I'm, now I'm wondering what I'm going to say. Um, have you ever had someone in your life where you're trying to explain something passionately to them and you know the importance of it? And they're like, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yes. And you know. <laughs> they think they got it, but you know they don't got it. Yeah. Our disciples. But that gives hopes to me because Jesus is still speaking to him again and again. Because sometimes, I got to be telling you, I'm Italian. Sometimes we are testaduras, hardheads. And sometimes maybe some of you guys can be hardheaded too. I'm not saying, not you, but everybody, no. <laughs> so listen, and all, and all these things, by the way, all these prophetic words that he's telling them, they all came to be exactly like he said, of course. Um, but I digress. So sometimes we also, we gloss over the courage. I want you to think about this, that uh, needed uh, to endure what Jesus was going to have to go through. He knew the pain, the rejection, the humiliation, let alone the sins of the world, the punishment for the sins of the world that he was going to take. And, and yet he went through all of this for you. That should blow you away. Peter, he did it for you because he cares about you and you, even you, even me. And our attitude should reflect and remember that steadfastness of Jesus, right? Right? that strength, that commitment that he had, right? We need to remember that in our walk because sometimes we can get fearful and afraid and want to run or want to hide, right? Or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. No. But that's why Hebrews chapter 12, this is one of my favorite life verses. I got a lot of favorite verses, but it says, let us fix our eyes on who? Jesus. And Why? He's the author and perfecter. Some of your translations say the starter and the finisher of your faith. I almost picture at a starting race, you know. But it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. The he endured all that for the joy set before him. You know what that joy was? That joy was the possibility that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You so that you would have a chance to go to heaven, and you would have a chance to live a godly life. That's why he endured that. You were the joy before him. And, and we need to remember and remind ourselves of that when we're going through troubles. Because <laughs> when we're in this race, right, running the race, right, we can get tired, we can get out of breath. I don't know if you ever run hard, it's like... <gasps> That's why we need to consider him, G not him, <laughs> it's just a picture I used, we need to consider Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. There's so much there that I'm not going to camp out on it, but I am going to say at some point in your life, and maybe it's not now, and if it's not now, wonderful, but you may become weary and and discouraged in your souls. You might find that there's people who are hostile to you. In fact, here's a promise that I've never yet seen on a bumper sticker. 
I never have seen this. All those who live godly lives will be persecuted. Nobody has that on a bumper sticker. But if you're leading a godly life, you're going to go through some of the same things that Jesus did. And that means people are going to be hostile to you and tear you down. And it's just... So we need to remind ourselves and consider Jesus. Right, let me fix my eyes on you, Jesus. Not what this person's saying, what that person's saying, what this person did, what that person did, what the situation is, who the president is. I don't get me started that. But I, 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 the finances are, let me fix my eyes on you. Right, right, because you are the starter and you're the finisher of my faith. It's Jesus. Who is it? Jesus. That's right. Mark 10 35 to 37 continues on. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. He, you remember that? He were, they were called the sons of thunder. They were the ones that wanted to rain down fire, right? On the Samaritans? Anyway. Because they weren't receiving them the correct way. <laughs> Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I'll get to that in a minute. Verse 36 and 37 says, uh, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you, he asked. And then it says, they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. That's all. <laughs> now, I, I, in light of what Jesus, think about, put yourself in, in this situation. Jesus is telling him, I don't know, hey, I am going to be persecuted I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be turned over to the... Pre They're going to mock me. They're going to whip me. They're going to scourge me. They're going to spit on me, and I'm going to die. Hey, can we have your stuff? I <laughs> Imagine, just to kind of... I don't know if this is a good illustration. I'm putting it in perspective. If I went to my kids and said, sons, sons, your dad, I've only got a few weeks left to live. And I want you, you know, this is what's going to happen. He's going to be mocked and he's going to be beaten. They're going to kill him. They're going to torture him. It's, it's going to be. And my kids are like, oh, well, can I have the TV? And oh, I want the Jeep. Me, pick, I want the this. You'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. That tells me the disciples not quite clicking. Do you know what I mean? Now, I, I don't, I'm just saying, it seems disrespectful to me, you know, uh, and if I was Jesus, I'll just be honest, a real emotion, I would be really discouraged. I've invested a lot in them. He's invested a lot in us, though, too, and he's patient with us, and so thank you, Lord, that they didn't always get it right either, right? Right? But it's almost like selfish children. Have you ever had one of your kids? I don't know if you ever had this when they were younger. I come up to you, Dad, Dad. Okay, just I just want you to say yes. Just just say yes to what I'm going to ask you next. Now you know whatever that is coming. Whenever they say that, Kim, it's good to see you. Whatever that next question is, it's not going to be. Dad, I just wanted to clean your room for you. Can I wash? The, I just want to wash the car and make it so beautiful for you because you work so hard. Mom, I just want to prepare dinner tonight some way. <sighs> Let me do the dishes for you. No, it's never that. It's always something selfish, and it's selfish with them. They're more concerned about themselves and their position than they are with Jesus. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, 28, Jesus already told the 12. He already told them by this time. They're going to sit on thrones. He's already told them this. So these guys are like, oh, we're going to sit on thrones? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you're going to judge. Jesus told them in, in those verses. He said, yeah, you're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. You know. So you'd think that would be good enough. But no. We want to sit at your right hand or your left hand. And I'll get to that in a second. Now, Matthew 10, 21 tells us that they got their mom involved, that their mom was in on it, in the status seeking as well. I, I, you know, a Jewish mom is probably like an Italian mom, right? 
Look at my boy. It's my boy. He's such a good boy. Oh, God. Jesus, would you, on your right hand, either of my boys, it doesn't, one can sit at the right hand and one can sit at the left. They're such good boys. <laughs> now, <laughs> sitting at the right hand would have been the first position, the most honored, and sitting at your left hand would have been the second most. So not only are they sitting on thrones, but now they're like jockeying position to be I want to be number one and number two. <laughs> oh, guys, it, there are places of honor. You can read about that for yourself in Psalm 110.1, one, or if you guys want to look up, just make sure you, I'm always telling you the truth, or 1 Kings 2.19. And, and Mark 10.38 goes on to say, Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. And they really didn't know. Yes, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, let me, hey, where's the microphone? Anybody? Anybody? Microphone? Oh, I have the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I never have the microphone. I'm not used to it. Is this on, George? All right. There you go, buddy. I, I know you're kind of bashing the disciples a little bit, um, <laughs> but what if they just had such a great relationship with Jesus that they could talk to him unafraid? Yeah, I, I, I think, think they I were think just they being did. straight up like a best friend, you know, like, hey. You Absolutely. Absolutely. However, and you know what? I think we all can have that relationship as a best friend. However, even as a best friend, if, if I went to my best friend and he was telling me that he was dying and he was going to be tortured and killed, yeah. hey, can I, you know, it, it, that would still be kind of a foolish thing. And that kind of uh, is a picture for us that, don't, that they don't get it. So I do think that we can talk to Jesus just like a friend. And if you'll notice, he's not saying, are you, it's a good thing I wasn't, I'd be like, dude, you gotta be kidding me. He doesn't say that. He told him to have childlike faith. You he's know, like, to he's think like, out of the box, guys, have, he, you know. He's like, he's like telling them, he's like, I want you guys to get this. He's been patient with them. And, he's, and that's what gives me courage and hope because that means he's going to be patient with me. That means that when he tells me again and again, and I don't get it, he's not going to attack me and bring the hammer. Does that make sense? But I still, even though that's the case, I'm not going to excuse the disciples. This is a bad thing that they're doing. So Jesus knows it too. He's like, guys, you don't know what you're asking. And he says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? And, and that was a good question. And in my opinion, James and John did not understand what they were asking. I think they were seeing this all as a worldly or a, a political position and not a spiritual one. Like, their idea of a Messiah was so ingrained in their heads that when Messiah comes, they're going to overthrow the Romans and they're going to have a worldly kingdom. And the Messiah is going to sit on the throne, you know, with his, you know, white horse and whatever, and, and the 12 disciples, and they're just going to reign. That's what they had on their minds, not a spiritual suffering servant. And so he's trying to correct them, and, and rightly he should. That word baptized there is the word baptizo in Greek, and it means to immerse, which is why we don't, just that's a little side note, why we don't sprinkle water on somebody's head. We immerse them, because when we're baptizing, we're bringing them all the way down. We, it, it means immerse, submerge, or dip down repeatedly, you know? And it's a picture of a person being immersed in trials, submerged in hardships, repeatedly dipped in temptation of suffering or suffering. And Jesus is saying, hey, are you, you guys are, are you able to do this? And their answer should have been, Lord, I don't know. I, well, with you, I guess I could do it. But no, but their answer is, oh yeah, we can do it. It's because they're not understanding. They're thinking of, a, of a, a, a political king, a worldly kingdom, I think of. And, and they're thinking, yeah, no problem. We can. It's no, it's no problem, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you know what? 
you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they've been prepared. And in my mind, I'm seeing the two disciples going like, again, they didn't high five, they didn't have that back. But this is my mind. This is why I picture James and John. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, we're going to sit the right and let you. Know, I don't know, but he's, he's let this. And, and, and I think Jesus is just going, oh. And because they think they've won something, and unfortunately, they don't know what they've accomplished <laughs> by saying, yeah, we'll, we'll drink from that. They don't even understand what that means. And they did drink from the cup of suffering, and they were baptized with the baptism of persecution, both these guys. And they were like bookends to the 12 disciples. Honestly, James was the first of the 12 disciples to experience this as he was imprisoned. He was beaten, he was tortured, and then he was eventually beheaded, right? Uh, in the book of Acts by Herod, chapter, Acts chapter 12, right? He was the very first one. And the very last one of the 12, right, was also imprisoned and tortured and beaten and boiled in oil, according to history, and finally exiled to a labor camp on Patmos. And so they were indeed, they did drink the cup of suffering. They did, uh, they were baptized in the baptism of, of persecution. And, and so that did take place. And it says in Mark chapter 10, 41, when the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with James and John. Now, the rest of the 10 disciples, they were furious with James and John, but I don't think it was a self-righteous, like, can't believe that you would be so self-centered as to ask him about that after he's telling us he's gonna, I think, and this is just an opinion, okay? Uh, I, I don't think they understood either. I, I honestly think that they did this because James and John asked first. Oh, great. Why didn't we do that? And unfortunately, um, they continued, even after this, they continued that self-centered me first attitude all the way up until the Last Supper. And you know what they're doing? If you read Luke chapter 22, 24 to 33, excuse me, we're not going to do it, but they're still arguing who's going to be first, who's going to be the greatest. I. Mark chapter 10, 42 goes, Jesus called them together. Guys, this is a lesson. This is a lesson time. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise, exercise authority over them. And so Jesus is reminding the disciples that, that the seeking of power and position over others is a worldly principle. I love what John MacArthur had to say about this particular verse. He said, the world has always been filled with ambitious, overcompetent, Comp competitive self-promoters who know no limits to their ambition. Many reach the heights of power driven by corrupt, proud hearts. They seek power at the expense of others. Ambition, overconfidence, and competitiveness mark the worldly pursuit of greatness by self-promotion. And that's how the world operates. But then he's going to say, but not so with you. You know what? I was talking with somebody. I met them for lunch and we were talking, I was, he was looking at getting into ministry and I was sharing with him and, and I, I talked to him, he's a really wonderful guy. And, and I, I said, you know what? Here's something to think about. He said, how many pastors, how many leaders do you think, how many pastors would be in their position if they didn't get paid anymore? Then you get to really see who is the servant of all. Unfortunately, I honestly think a majority wouldn't. But if you're really, if you're called by the Lord, can I tell you what? You're going to meet in somebody's home. You're going to have a home fellowship. You're going to still have a Bible study. It's not going to matter whether you get, now, work must do his wages, I get all that. But the, the bottom line is, you're doing it for the Lord, not for the applause of men. If you all think I'm wonderful, that's so nice. I'm not, it's only because of Jesus. But, can I tell you something? If you all didn't like me, you know what, I still should do it anyway because I'm doing it for the Lord. So too with anybody who's called to ministry. It has to be because we do it for Jesus. 
Mark 10, 43 and 44 says, not so with you. Instead, among you, whoever wants to be great must be your servant. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, serve others. Look, when you come here, you want to be served. God says, no, I want you to serve others. That's the heart. And he says, whoever wants to be first must be the slave at all. Jesus isn't saying the desire for greatness is bad. He's just redefining it. He's, he's redefining it from God's point of view. He says, the way up in the kingdom of God is down, humbling yourself, serving everybody. Servant in, in Greek is diakonos, and that means one who runs errands for another. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, run errands, do other things for other people in Jesus' name. If you want to be first, the word slave is doulos, and that means one who gives himself up for another's cause or he's devoted to someone to the disregard of their own interests. I'm going to put my interests aside because I'm going to do what you want me to do, Jesus. Does that make sense, everybody? And then he says in Mark 10, 45, he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And then we'll close out with these verses, these last few verses in Mark 10, 46. Starts us off with blind Bartimaeus. It says, then he came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples were together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, Bar just means son, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he didn't listen to those people. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus had been journeying toward his final goal, the cross in Jerusalem, and now is almost at the end. Jerusalem was about 15 miles southwest of Jericho. And, and as they were leaving Jericho, this blind Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus repeatedly, not caring what others think about him. He just knew Jesus would help him. And, and that's a good example for us to call out. Listen, when you need help, call out to Jesus. And he says, son of David, that's a messianic title. It's like saying, Messiah, I, I, it's, it's saying, I, I have faith, I have belief, I know you're the one. And he knew what he wants. He wants mercy. Like every man, uh, anyone who's been saved, this guy needed mercy. No one ever comes to Jesus thinking they deserve something. We all come just saying, man, we need mercy. But I want to encourage you. This guy called out to Jesus. And when you'll do that, he'll answer you. If it's sincere, he didn't care what other people... T Listen, you be the one to call out to Jesus. Will you do that? That's, you know what? We think of Jesus as a spare tire. Oh, when the tire blows, then I'll call. How about you use it as a steering wheel? How about we're always calling out to Jesus? Listen, this is what he says. This is in the Psalms, 17.6. He said, I will call on you, my God, and you will what? Answer me, turn your ear to me. So if you'll call on him, he will answer you. Not only that, but it says the Bible, it says in the Bible, he'll draw near to you if you'll call on him. Jeremiah 33, 3, he'll show you things that you don't even know. He says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great mighty things which you do not know. If you call upon the name of the Lord. Not only that, Psalm 145, 18 says he'll draw near to you if you'll call on him. This is such a deal. It says the Lord is near to all those who call on him, to those who call on him in truth. If you will call, he'll bring those river of living water and refresh your soul. And then finally, if you don't even know Jesus or you feel like you're drowning, <laughs> but you'll call on him, the Bible says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then we ends with this. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called him to the blind man and said, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. And him throwing his cloak aside, that was probably the most precious thing he had, this blind man. He's like, I'm not going to need it anymore, this beggar's cloak. And he used the term rabbi, which actually this particular word in Greek, rabboni, means lord and master. He was saying, I'm humbly submitted to you. You're the Messiah. 
And he asked him what he wants because I think he was trying to draw out his faith. And then finally, this last verse here in Mark 10, 52, and I'm guessing you're going to want to pray. No, 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 yeah. no, I just want you to know you've been preaching for 48 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Let me make a note to rebuke Pastor Gary. <laughs> and then he said something that I thought was really cool at the very end here. It says, listen, he was willing to receive it. He's just crying out for mercy like any of us who's got saved. We just, Lord, I ask, I need you. And then go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So, I guess I just want to ask, uh, I'm, I'm praying for God to give me the right words, and I don't know what to say exactly. But some of you have been walking with the Lord for a long time, and maybe your sight has become a little dim. Maybe you've become a little weighed down, and maybe you've been looking at things maybe you shouldn't, or... And maybe God wants to open your eyes and reveal things to you again. And maybe you have not yet asked to be saved. You've not said, hey, Lord, I'm going to cry out for mercy. I know I'm a sinner. I need you, Jesus. I need to be saved. Maybe you don't understand that your sin separated you from a holy God. And that Jesus paid the price for that sin. He died and he rose again so that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And maybe you haven't crawled out to him for that. And I, I just want to pray right now for both of you. And then I want to invite you afterwards to some wonderful fellowship in the back. There some people have brought some wonderful food and, and they've cooked some pulled pork and there's bounce houses. There's an obstacle course in the back. Um, I don't know why there's a dunk tank still here, but I was, don't use that, Lord. It's supposed to be gone, but... But I just want to take a minute and pray for you guys. Can we, can we do that? Can you just pray with me? Can we call out to the Lord? Lord, I, I, I want to say thank you, Lord, that we can, first, that we can call out to you. And I want to ask, Lord, if there's anyone here, Lord, who maybe their eyes have grown a little dim or dull or cataracted with the world stuff, Lord, that you would clear their vision, that they would cry out to you right now and say, Lord, help me to see you clearly again, Lord God. I pray that they would call out in their hearts, Lord, let me fix my eyes on you. Help me, Lord, to fix my eyes on you back again and not to look to the right or to the left, but to hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk in it, Lord. And I would keep my eyes fixed on you, Lord, for the rest of my life, Lord. Will you have mercy on me and help me to do that, Lord? I pray that there would be folks calling out to him right now, asking for that. And I pray if there's anyone here, Lord God, that hasn't yet accepted and received you as Lord and Savior, that they would call out just like blind Bartimaeus, saying, have mercy on me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Save me. I don't even understand everything. But I know I need salvation. I know I'm a sinner, and I can't get saved without you. Will you help me, Lord God? Will you give me a new heart and new mind, Lord? Will you help me to follow you? I can't do it on my own. I know you died and you rose again, and, and I just want to be with you, Lord, forever. Help me, Lord. Have mercy on me. And if there's anyone in here, Lord, who's crying out to you in their hearts, I pray that you would answer them with the gift of grace and salvation by faith, Lord God. And I pray if there's anyone who has asked, Lord, that for that, that they would just tell somebody so we can put some Bibles or materials in their hands, Lord. I pray that you would bless each person here, Lord. Help them to have a great time just fellowshipping, Lord. Keep back the rain, Lord God, and just let the kids and, and each of the adults just enjoy some good food and fellowship together. Thank you for this group that you've brought here today, Lord. They're special. Bless them and help them to call out to you in every situation they're in, Lord God because I know you'll answer them and you'll show them things that they never knew. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.